I can remember being taken to see Space Jam in the cinema as a child, and for 88 minutes I sat there transfixed. The wacky characters, the wild tone, the colourful action. I loved it. But then, right at the end of the movie, this thing happens, and I'll never forget it. Michael Jordan dunks a basketball, and we freeze frame on him. And on his face is what I can only describe as a contorted, horrified scream. And the credits just pour over him. This moment still shakes me. Why does a children's movie as light and joyous as Space Jam end like this? That question has haunted me for decades and brought me on a voyage from which I have only recently returned. And with a single shocking realization, the film currently masquerading as Space Jam 2 is a lie. I know how insane this sounds, so all I ask is that you follow me on this journey and come to your own conclusions. And our first stop in doing this is in understanding the true nature of Space Jam 1. See, Space Jam is not a story about Bugs Bunny or basketball or that sexuality is confusing and complicated. It's about what happens when our wildest dreams come to be and leave us trapped in a nightmare. And the reason this is all surfacing now and you're finally seeing people begin to plumb the infinite depths of this movie is that the key to Space Jam is its star, Michael Jordan. But the key to Michael Jordan only came to light last year in the form of the 2020 documentary series the Last Dance. As a child who grew up in 90s Ireland, I knew only two things about basketball. That got Will Smith in trouble in the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, and that Michael Jordan was a big fucking deal. The kind of once in a generation super athlete that completely transcends their sport. And what The Last Dance is, is that story. How this kid from Brooklyn soared to such a meteoric level, he dragged the entire sport of basketball with him. And it's a beautifully told story, taking us all the way from Jordan's early life where he would compete with his brothers for the approval of their father, to his college years where his skill would grow exponentially week to week as he absorbed every play, every technique, quickly surpassing everyone around him. That drive taking him to the 1988 Chicago Bulls. Jordan becoming the beating heart of that team. An offensive monster who could cut through entire teams. He became so dangerous and feared on the court that opposing teams would develop their own Jordan rules. Like the Detroit Pistons, who would single out Jordan and brutally assault him the entire game, only for Jordan to spend an entire year rebuilding his body, allowing him to physically dominate other players. Returning the next year and humiliating the Pistons with a 4 nothing sweep. This was a huge part of what Michael Jordan was. He didn't just want to beat you, he wanted to crush you. All it would take is a reporter so much as breathe another player's name in the same sentence as Jordan, and Jordan would lock onto that player the next game, finding them and eviscerating them in front of 20,000 and screaming fans. And this happened over and over and over. You can see the despair in the faces of these legends of the NBA who one by one are all dismantled at the feet of Jordan. Shattering record after record and taking the Bulls to an infathomable six NBA championship victories. All driven by his insatiable drive to be the best. And it wasn't just confined to basketball. Jordan would constantly challenge everyone around him. Rounds of golf, hands of poker, games of coin toss. Whether it was $10 or 10,000, it didn't matter. To the point that people actually thought Jordan had a gambling problem to which he responded, I don't have a gambling problem, I have a competition problem. It was that drive that took Jordan to the apex of the world. Seeing press footage of Jordan during the mid 90s is like watching some bizarre caricature of what a celebrity is, as he's swamped and mobbed by hundreds of people from the moment he steps outside. 
but it's in those appearances you can start to see a kind of numbness set in, a kind of space opening up between him and other people, only widened by his insatiable drive to be the best. He was known for being extremely hard on his teammates. He'd scream at them in anger. He could be cruel and tyrannical, demanding from them as much as he did himself, and growing furious when other people could not meet that standard. By late in his career, he'd become a deity of basketball, but the price he'd paid was his ability to meaningfully connect to other people. And I think this really genuinely got to Jordan. Watch what happens when the crew of The Last Dance ask him about this. If you don't want to play that way, don't play that way. Break. Jordan was an icon but an icon alone. A man who gave everything to breach the clouds of humanity and glimpse the face of God. Space Jam released in 1996 and combined two of the biggest pop culture phenomenon of that era, the Looney Tunes and Michael Jordan. And immediately, look at the kind of movie being made here. A rare hybrid of live action footage and hand drawn animation, the likes of which only a handful of other films exist. And that's because these movies are a fucking nightmare to make, combining the most technically difficult aspects of both mediums, with the kind of shot you're seeing on screen now being a genuinely mind blowing feat of artistry and skill. The fact that this was done on mid 90s technology really melts my brain. And what I'm getting at is that even at the core of its DNA, Space Jam is an impossible goal pursued by the best in their field. The exact kind of production that would appeal to a man like Michael Jordan. And you can feel those themes directly in the story, not only in how it conveys Jordan's insatiable drive for power planted in him by his father. Hey. Get good enough, you can do anything you want to, Michael. But also in that Space Jam takes place during the real life period of Jordan's career, where he grew so disillusioned with basketball, feeling there were no new horizons left to conquer, that he quit the NBA and began a career in baseball. I just feel at this particular time that I reached the uh, pinnacle of my basketball career and I must retire. In other words, this was Jordan at his most hungry, his most desperate to feel challenged again. And what the medium of animation allows is for Jordan to get his wish, ripping him from the world of the possible as he transcends to something more. The fictional plane of the Looney Tunes, where he now faces things beyond human, massive unknowable beings in the Monstars, led by the tyrannical Mr. Swackhammer. And just look at the sense of danger and power conveyed through their transformation sequence. It's that feeling that makes the Monstars such a vital part of this story, as they force Jordan to face something he never could in reality beings more powerful than he is, who are able to make Jordan, this master of the art, feel as weak and insignificant as the very basketballs he's abused his entire life. Defeated and destroyed, it's only with the Looney Tunes Jordan finds hope, and particularly in his strangely intimate relationship with Bugs Bunny, the two growing so close that even Daffy Duck, the Looney Tunes number two character, is left in the shadows. And so, Jordan stands with his new friends, once again on the precipice of the impossible, and over and over, the Looney Tunes crash against the unyielding cliffs of the Monstars. And it's horrifying. But through that struggle, in the final moment of the game, Michael Jordan reaches deep within himself, and in that endless pursuit of victory and perfection, gives the only thing left he has yet to give. Discarding his human nature and becoming something impossible and different, elongating his arm to grotesque proportions, and winning the game. It's one of the most profound but horrifying moments in cinema. Jordan is victorious, again, but now an impossible bastard chimera. Not human, not cartoon, 
but a single unfathomable being and now more alone than he's ever been is forced back to the world of men his new power never to be tested his world empty of all horizons because when our wildest dreams become reality when every mountain is climbed and each dragon slain what is waiting for us beyond that final horizon this is the question space jam asks and its whispered answer in this final moment is nothing it is upon this horrifying revelation jordan screams this is where i originally wanted this video to end but as i discover it's only here where our story begins i couldn't unsee what i'd seen in space jam but that left me with a problem everything i had learned all that meaning and information it was completely incompatible with what i'd seen of space jam 2. how was this no longer a story of michael jordan where was the concepts of loneliness power and isolation it just it made no sense but what really ignited my curiosity was this quote from Joe Pikta, director of Space Jam 1, who had refused to return for the second movie, in which he said, it's ridiculous to try and make a different movie out of it. And just notice the oddly specific wording here. He uses the word different, but not another. It was just a hunch, but something felt strange, and so I started to look into Joe Pikta, and what I found just didn't make sense. This is the man who's directed the single most successful and profitable basketball movie in history, and yet, not only is his name missing from the end credits of Space Jam 1, but checking his IMDb reveals that he's never worked on a single other movie either before or after Space Jam. And something about all this was starting to feel really not right. I took to Twitter, curious to see if anyone else thought that there was anything strange going on with Space Jam 2. Responses poured in, but one that stood out to me came from an account called Miracle Jan Doe. And it said, if you're not serious, walk away like all the other cowards. Now, I get a we'll say decent number of crazies on Twitter, but upon investigating this person's profile, something about it just felt oddly familiar. And so against my better judgment, I DM'd him asking for clarification as to what he meant. And when checking my messages the next day, I got a response. I'm talking about Space Jam 2, the real Space Jam 2. I asked him to elaborate, only for the account to fall silent. I'd hit a dead end, but I just couldn't let this go. And so I began to pour over old Space Jam footage, including the old VHS tape my parents had given me for my birthday to see if there were any differences between it and the modern cuts of Space Jam. And I was disappointed to learn there weren't. That's when I discovered something. Right at the end of the VHS, there's this little making of section going over how the different aspects of the film production worked, and as it ended, I sat back re-examining my notes, looking for something, anything, but after a couple of minutes, text just appeared on screen that read, sequel, and this footage played. He just kept sending us newer and newer drafts of the script, and each time it got less and less feasible. He had all these strange notes about it being the world's first fourth dimensional movie. And eventually I just had to call a meeting and it was like, Mr. Jordan, Michael, what you're asking for here, it's... It's just not possible. And I'll never forget. Without blinking, he just looks at me and he says, You think I got six championship rings by obeying 
what's possible. And something about it just, just turned my blood to ice. What did he mean by obey? This interview was scrubbed from all future releases of Space Jam, and its implications were massive. And so I poured back over Space Jam, all the articles, all the research, and what everything kept coming back to was Joe Pikta. Who was this mysterious man who disappeared from the film industry? And that's when it all clicked. Watch what happens when we use advanced imaging software to remove the items obscuring Pikta's face. That's right, Michael Jordan. And what about the writer of Space Jam, Leo Benvenuti, who had also never worked on a single other movie besides Space Jam? Michael Jordan. Its producer, Daniel Goldberg, Michael fucking Jordan. And it all starts to come together. Space Jam was created by Michael Jordan, a chronicle of his life and loneliness at the peak of humanity. And the reason people think it's a kid's movie is because it was only the first part of a bigger story. But something in that true sequel scared Warner Brothers so badly they felt a need to cover it up creating an alternate second movie that had nothing to do with the original, effectively sealing away the existence of the real Space Jam 2 forever. And this is when I got my final message from Miracle Jan Doe, and its contents horrified me. Friday, 4.30, and my home address, and... How? How could anyone know where I live? Who was this person? Unless... Oh god. Oh my god, no! It can't be! No! <sighs> okay. Uh, I, I... I just heard a knock from my front door. It's exactly 4.30 and I... Um, I don't know what's happening. I'm, I'm kind of afraid. <sighs> okay. Here we go. this? No. No. I held in my hands the full script and production notes for a film called Space Jam 2, and there were full illustrated storyboards for the entire movie. Parts of it didn't make sense at first, and I knew my final terrible responsibility to this video. I must unleash this story upon the world. And so now, I present to you, in full, Space Jam 2 Battle for Reality. We fade in from darkness. We see a hand grasping a basketball gliding towards a glowing hoop beckoning in the distance. Camera flashes fill a gigantic arena as the dull roar of the crowd rises. The Bulls lose! The Bulls lose! Jordan fails to secure his seventh championship ring! Michael Jordan hits the ground, devastated, and he stands, defeated. And suddenly, from off camera, a voice. Um... Mr. Jordan, uh, is it okay if I kick your autograph? Jordan smiles. Sure, kid. What's your name? Um, LeBron James, sir. Uh, Mr. Jordan, uh, you're still my hero. Even if you're not the best anymore, 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 you're not the best anymore. <laughs> Jordan awakens, gasping and panicked, when, Michael, Michael, it's okay, you're safe, you're here with me. It is Bugs Bunny. I, I know, I I'm sorry, I, I just, I, I had that dream again. And the kid, he, shh, 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 Michael, Michael, that was years ago, you're, you're not that person anymore. You don't always gotta be chasing the next horizon. You're incredible. 
just the way you are. Across Jordan's face cracks a small, delicate smile. Bugs, I... I know you were a cartoon, but sometimes it's like you're the only thing keeping me human. And they kiss. We slowly pull out to reveal someone watching the scene on a glowing monitor, a mechanical claw gripping an armrest in the foreground. We cut to reveal Mr. Swackhammer, the villain of the first movie. Half his body mechanized from the injuries he incurred from being shot into the sun in Space Jam 1. Oh, Jordan, you think you can walk away after what you did to me? You wanna see what's over that next horizon, buddy? Well, I'll show you your worst nightmare. The scene fades as a haunting chorus of cackles rings out from the darkness. We fade to a lush forest. Bugs, bugs, it's bad, it's real bad. Tweety Bird flies, panicked. Whoa, whoa, calm down there, little buddy. What's the problem? Bugs, the monsters, they're back, but they're different this time. They're more powerful, and we have to face them in seven days. But that's impossible. We, we never signed the contract. But someone did, Bugs. Someone did. But you can't mean... Yeah, I do. There's a traitor among the Looney Tunes. Well, if we got no choice, looks like it's time to jam. To Space Jam! Again! Uh, the next page of the script just reads, Training montage that is way better than that piece of shit, Rocky. We fade in on an extreme close-up of Jordan, sweat pooling at his brow, and slowly pull back to reveal the interior of a massive stadium filled with roaring fans. He looks shaken before Bugs places his hand gently on Jordan's shoulder. Hey champ, remember, you don't gotta be the best. We just gotta be better than them. If things get bad out there, just look for me and I'll be there. Thanks Bugs. I know we got this. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Galactic Showdown, the twice-in-a-lifetime battle for supremacy. Introducing first the reigning champions, the kings of tomorrow, it's the Toon Squad. And introducing their opponents, the Cosmic Terrors, those from beyond, the nightmares of the Warner Brothers Cinematic Universe, the Monstars Generation 2, Jared Leto's The Joker, The Matrix's Agent Smith, Walking Phoenix's The Joker, Heath Ledger's The Joker, Mark Hamill's The Joker, Jack Nicholson's The Joker, and Cesar Romero's the Joker. Oh my f***ing god. And the battle begins and oh my god, it's hard to watch ladies and gentlemen. It is a massacre out there. The Looney Tunes just cannot compete. In the center of the court, Agent Smith and Michael Jordan clash. You're good, Mr. Jordan. You're very good. But you're still only human. A shockwave erupts outwards from the force between the two, ripping the stadium in half and tearing open a massive crack in the earth. And in the impact, Bugs loses his balance and plummets into the darkness below, only catching himself in the final second. Bugs! Bugs struggles to hold on, and above him stands his old friend, Daffy Duck. Daff, you, you gotta help me, pal. I'm, I'm slipping. You want to know who signed the contract, Bugs? Maybe it's the same person who for years has rotted as your punchline! Can you even comprehend the humiliation I've endured? 
the amount of book shots I've taken to the face for you and for what? <sighs> to be number three next to you and your little boyfriend? <laughs> You want to know what's up, Doc? How about your fucking life? No! And in that moment, Michael Jordan just lets go. We see Jordan, alone. Both the stadium and the city that surrounded him just moments ago, now ash and rubble. Having lost the one person who could make him feel like enough, a deep emptiness rips open inside him. Into that emptiness floods all the power, ambition, and rage. If he must truly be left with nothing, he will reign over everything. Okay, we need to take a second and pause here because this next part of the movie gets a little wild, as this is where the fourth dimensional aspect of Space Jam 2 begins. And the way Michael Jordan wanted this to play out was, say Space Jam 2 played in a cinema, and in the other screens, there was being played a Lord of the Rings movie, a Batman movie, and a Scooby-Doo movie. At this point, the real-life Michael Jordan planned to have alternate edits of those films played where he would invade their realities and attack their characters, defeating them and proving himself the most dominant being in the universe. There's even blueprints in the script for a special trap door Michael had designed that he would hide in during select screenings of Space Jam 2, and at this point in the movie would leap out and attack audiences with basketballs. That is the kind of terror he wanted this moment to elicit. He wanted reality itself to feel under threat from his unstoppable power. Jordan, now the most dominant force in the entire universe. Or is he? A basketball careens into Jordan's face, its force hurling him to the ground and he turns towards a figure silhouetted against a glorious light. You. That's right, motherfucker. And LeBron James steps forth. I've waited a long time for this boy. Michael, you are my hero. And the impossible battle begins, a showdown beyond both reality and reason, and the Earth Quivers. But as the fight drags on, LeBron is just a little faster, an iota stronger, a fraction more skilled. And Jordan realizes with horror that for the first time in his life, he is facing an opponent he cannot overcome. And he slams into the cold earth. Impossible! You want to know why you can't beat me, Michael? It's because the only thing driving you forward is your selfish desire to see what's over that next horizon. Well, I'll tell you, Michael. Just another goddamn horizon! But me? I'm fighting for something greater than myself. For each life on this planet and every other, every being that will blink out of existence if I let you take even one more step forward. They are all here with me now, Michael, meaning there's an infinity inside me. Compared to that, your empty ambition is nothing. Jordan's vision swims, his consciousness fading, but just as oblivion begins to take hold, he sees a great light fill the sky and the gates of heaven open, and from them, Bugs Bunny emerges. Bugs, I can't beat him. It's okay, Michael, it's okay. 
You can rest now. It's over. It's finally over. Bugs. I know you were caught too. But sometimes it's like you're the only thing keeping me human. His last connection to humanity broken, all the ambition, all the power, all the hunger, it consumes Michael Jordan and a great and terrible new being is born. Neo Michael Jordan, the Infinity Slayer. His final foe obliterated, Neo Michael Jordan turns his sights to the stars, and the cosmos themselves weep under the infinite onslaught of the Infinity Slayer, until there is simply nothing left. Jordan floats above all, king of an empty universe, for the first time his vantage truly barren of all horizons. The production notes here indicate that this shot was meant to last 400 years in real time until that proved unfeasible in the animatic process. Days, months, years, decades, centuries. Time, space, purpose, it all becomes nothing. He is supreme. He is alone. Until... Oh, I've waited. Oh, how I've waited. But now... Now you're finally here. Goku. To be continued in Space Jam 3, War of the Infinity Beasts. Friends, thank you for joining me today. Straight away, I just want to thank Rebecca Reynolds for the inhuman amount of work she put into this video. You can show your appreciation by checking out her Twitter, at Brobex. Also, huge thank you to Kiri Kai for playing the parts of Michael Jordan and LeBron James. Huge shout out, of course, to my patrons who make this and everything else I do possible. This video in particular, I'd like to thank Grant Van Tassel, Winx, E, Augusta Wickman, Carly Bay Jepsen, ContraPoints, Hannah Knott. Find me as ever on the Let's Fight a Boss video game podcast and on Twitter at iPatchWolf. Friends, take care of yourselves and I'll see you next time.